You know what, y'all? I finally saw the movie The Green Mile. <laughs> I know I'm late on it, but it was a good movie. Great movie. And Michael Clark Duncan should have won the Oscar for that role. That was his first leading role after doing the movie Armageddon, which is a classic also. But um, Green Mile, he did a good job in that. But right after that, you know, I had to watch Welcome Home Roscoe Jenkins. <laughs> That's my junk right there when he played Otis. But um, anyway, now, when it comes to Michael Clark Duncan, nobody had nothing bad to say about him. No, you know what? One person did. That was the actor Michael J. White, who said, he said, he said Michael Clark Duncan changed once he made it in Hollywood. But that's another story. Y'all make sure y'all check his interview out on Vlad. That was a pretty good deep. That was a deep interview. That was a deep interview. But everybody else loved Michael Clark Duncan, especially in Hollywood. They used to call him Big Mike the gentle giant because he was one of the nicest people you could ever meet now some say he was one of the only actors that had fans come up to him of any age or race or gender that wouldn't ask for an autograph instead they wanted a big hug from him and his size how big he was standing 6'5 weighing over 300 pounds all muscle made him one of the largest actors in Hollywood. And what's crazy is he didn't even catch his big break in Hollywood until the age of 42. But the impact and the legacy he left always would be there, man. A workaholic, a health nut, always smiling with positive energy, treated everybody with respect. And like I said, man, he was, he was a nice guy with a kind soul. But see, the thing about being a nice guy, man, and trusting everybody, especially in the industry, it can hurt you in the long run. And some say during his final days, he had the wrong people around him. Let's get into his story, man. I ain't gonna waste no time. Now, Michael Clark Duncan was born December 10th, 1957 in Chicago, Illinois. Now, he grew up on the south side of Chicago in the infamous Robert Taylor Holmes housing projects. And his mother, Jean Duncan, raised him and his sister Judy as a single parent after their father, who was a railroad worker, left when Michael was about six years old. Now, Michael did say after seeing how his alcoholic father acted towards his mom, that made him never smoke or drink a day in his life. Now, his mother would work 18 hour days as a cleaner to provide for him and his sister. And growing up, he loved sports and had dreams of making it to the NBA or going to the NFL to play football. But see, in high school, right, his mom, she refused to allow him to play high school football because she feared he would get hurt. She would let him play basketball, but not football. She actually really wanted him to become an actor. And she would encourage him to read books all the time because she wanted him to pursue acting. Because she used to act back in the day. And... She started helping him on how to read and say acting lines. Now, by the age of 12 years old, his voice turned into a baritone. It got very deep and he started focusing on acting as a kid. And when he did that, the other kids in the neighborhood used to try to fight him all the time. But his sister, Judy, used to hold him down and she had his back because she could fight. And then Chicago too, she could fight. And and look, his mom didn't play, man. She did her best to keep him away from that street life. Cause at that time, gangs were everywhere. I mean, it was so bad, right? Like one time, his basketball coach wanted to come to his neighborhood by himself 
to recruit some more players. And Michael had to tell him like, you can come in my neighborhood, but look, I will have to get in the car with you to escort you out. That's how bad it was. The gang culture was crazy during that time. And look, his mom, she wasn't having it either. She ain't played with that gangs and street stuff. And look, Michael said one time he came home to tell his mother he was going to join a gang and she hit him in the head with a frying pan. <laughs> we need more mothers like that today, man. After graduating high school, right, uh, he went to play basketball at Kankakee Community College and he was the starting center for that team and it was good. They was good. They was ranked number one for a while. And look, Michael, man, he was so determined to make it out of the projects, out of the hood, and succeed at school that he would hitchhike 17 miles to and from campus every day. Wow. And later on, he would transfer to play basketball at um, the College of Alcorn State and study communications in Mississippi. And by that time, when he got to Alcorn State, 6'5 in height, weighing over 300 pounds, he was playing the power four position. But see, Alcorn State, they tried to convince him to play defensive end on their football team too. And they told him in two years, he'll probably make the NFL, which was his dream. And after hearing that, he really wanted to play football then, but when he told his mother, <laughs> she told him, nah, you ain't playing no football because she didn't want him to get hurt. And you know, she still thought acting was the best thing for him. Now here's another crazy fact about Michael around that time, right? He was there at the Chicago White Sox Stadium for a disco demolition night. I don't know if you ever heard of that disco demolition night which remains one of the most controversial events in music history. Look, that was the night that 50,000 people showed up to the stadium to throw and destroy all their disco records on a baseball field because, you know, white people felt that disco was the product of homosexuals, blacks, and Latins, and so on. And But here's the thing, though, right? Majority of the records they brought and destroyed they were supposed to be bringing disco records and throw them on the, throw them on the field, destroy them, and burn them. They started bringing R&B music, jazz, funk, all the black artist stuff. And you know what? Look, I'm going to break that story down, man. I'm going to put that on my new show that y'all named History Underrated, which is coming soon, so stay tuned. But anyway, there wasn't many black people that was there at that stadium that baseball game that night but uh michael was there that night on that field on that historical day now let's get back to the story right now still in college michael had got some bad news back home that his mother was very sick so he quit college to go and take care of his mother because he loved his mother he was a mama's boy and he ended up getting a job digging ditches for a gas company. Plus, he got a part-time job being a bouncer in security at some clubs in Chicago because of his size. And look, even as a bouncer, he was still a nice guy. I mean, if you would get out of line acting up drunk, acting crazy, he might put you in a sleeper hole or something until you pass out and just sit you down in the corner or something because he really didn't want to hurt nobody. He was just a nice guy. And you know them nice people. You don't want to make them mad. But look, he always used to tell his friends he wanted to pursue acting. And they believed in him. But they would always joke on him too. And they started calling him Hollywood Mike. And after that, his mother's health got better. And she would push him to go and pursue his dreams of acting, especially when the opportunity came when he went on the road as a security guard for a traveling theater company. And that company would travel the world. And that's when he made the decision to leave Chicago and just stay in California with that theater company. Now in California, 
he went to about 50 auditions and nobody would hire him as an actor and he was ready to give up. He thought about even joining the LAPD as a police officer. But his mother told him to stay there and keep trying and want nothing in Chicago for him. Look, it got so bad, it got so rough, man, that at one point, he ended up living in his car under a bridge. So, to make some money, he started doing security jobs. That's what he was good at until he found some acting gigs and everybody used to call him. His nickname then was Big Mike. Next thing you know, he started appearing in music videos for the rap group Quo in 1994. Who remembers those two kids in that rap group called Quo? One was white and um, the other guy was like mixed or something. And the one that was mixed, he ended up marrying Zaria from the show Parenthood. Quo, they were actually signed to Michael Jackson's record label, MJJ Records, with the R&B group Brownstone, who was also signed at that time. But anyway, look, in 1995, he also made a cameo appearance in the R. Kelly download video as one of Mr. Big's bodyguards. After that, then some acting work for TV shows started coming his way, even though there was little small roles like the soap opera, The Bold and the Beautiful, um, the show Renegade, Married with Children, um, the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, which led to him being a personal bodyguard for Will Smith. That same year, in 1995, he finally got in his first movie, which was Ice Cube's Friday, as one of Debo's friends when he was gambling on the sidewalk before Debo knocked out Red after he asked for his bike back. Uh, I gotta watch that Friday, man. And look, he was also... He was also an extra in Tupac's video, California Love, which had that theme, uh, the Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome um, theme. In an interview, right, comedian Chris Tucker, who was also in that video, said in one of the scenes, he was showing off. Chris was showing off and overacting and almost fell off the Jeep and died. But Michael Clark Duncan saved his life that day. After that, more security jobs came his way and he started being a personal bodyguard for Martin Lawrence. He used to be on the Martin Show working security. Um, Jamie Foxx, LL Cool J, and the Notorious B.I.G. At the same time, but he was still doing little acting roles on TV while doing security. But see, look, the crazy part is this. The night that Biggie got killed on March 9th 1997 Michael was supposed to be working that night protecting Biggie but look he switched shifts that night with another bodyguard to guard singer Babyface instead wow never knew that man he said in an interview that he really don't like to talk about that night because Biggie was his friend but what had happened was he got a phone call earlier that day from another bodyguard friend that asked him who he was working with that night. And Michael told him that he was working for Biggie that night. That's when his bodyguard friend asked him if he wanted to switch for a baby face. And you know, Michael, he agreed because that was more of his league it was a nice and low-key, laid-back, smooth R&B crowd. A lot of ladies. He liked that. And look, the Babyface show went good with no problems. And when Michael got home and turned on the TV, that's when he heard that Biggie was killed. Hmm, interesting. Because look, Michael said the way he bodyguards his clients... He would have been right there beside Biggie in the car that night. And he also probably would have been shot and killed. That's crazy, man. I wonder who the other security guard was. I know shout outs to Gene Dill. I don't know. And you know what? When that happened that night, when Biggie got killed that night, Michael quit doing security. And he just focused on acting because... It was the height of the East Coast and the West Coast beef. And he just said, 
it's not worth it. But that year, he, he was in a lot of stuff, though. Like the Jamie Foxx show, the Wayans Brothers, Living Single. He did a bunch of other TV shows, too. His resume was getting, it was getting bigger. Now, the following year, he landed a role in the movie Caught Up with Bo Keen Woodbine and Cinder Williams. Eh, it's not a bad movie. You know, I like all the urban hood movies. Then he started getting a lot of movie roles as a bouncer, like the movie Bullworth with uh, Holly Berry, um, Ice Cube's Players Club, uh, Night at the Roxbury with Will Ferrell, many more. Then he finally was casted in his first blockbuster movie, which was titled Armageddon with the legendary actor Bruce Willis. That was a that was a good movie. That was a dope movie. That movie grossed over $500 million in the box office. Now, here's the thing, though. While working on that movie with Bruce Willis, they struck up a good relationship. They became real good friends. And that's when Bruce Willis recommended him for his biggest role he ever did. He would play the gentle, spirited, death row inmate with magical healing powers who was put to death for two murders he did not commit named John Coffey in the movie The Green Mile with Tom Hanks, which is based on uh, Stephen King's 1996 novel. Now, look, Bruce Willis, he put the word in for him to get that role, but he told Michael before he put the word in, he needs to read the book at least twice to get familiar with the character because that was one of Bruce Willis' favorite books. And look, because at first, they was going to get Shaquille O'Neal for the role of John Coffey in The Green Mile. But after Bruce Willis introduced Michael to the director, done deal. The director of the movie, Frank Darabont, he was big time, man. He did Shawshank Redemption, Freddy Krueger, Nightmare on M Street. I think he did part three. He did the movie The Fly, but he said Michael cried at the first audition because he was so proud to audition for him because he just wanted to make his mom proud. He's a mama's boy, man. He loved his mama. Now, the director, Frank Darabont, also said they almost fired Michael because his acting skills weren't that good, but after having a long talk with him, he became the most improved actor on the set. And that movie did like $280 million in the box office and was nominated and won all types of awards. And Michael himself, he earned an Oscar nomination for Best Actor in a Supporting Role and a Golden Glove nomination for Best Performance by an Actor in a Supporting Role in a Motion Picture. Now, the crazy part is, a bunch of black institutions were going to boycott the Green Mile movie because they didn't like the way that Michael portrayed the character and which captures the stereotype black man who is accused of raping and killing a white person. After he did that movie, more big roles started coming like the whole nine yards with Bruce Willis in 2000. And uh, that did about 110 million in the box office too. In 2001, he did the movie The Planet of the Apes, which made about $360 million in the box office. In 2002, he was casted in the movie Scorpion King with the wrestler The Rock because they became good friends after meeting after one of his wrestling matches one day. And Michael was a big wrestling fan too. In 2003, he landed a role in the movie Daredevil with Ben Affleck in which he played the Kingpin for Marvel Comics. But see, here's the thing about that role. First of all, the Kingpin character was a white man, so it was challenging for him because he was black. Secondly, when he was cast for that role, he already weighed about 300 pounds. And they told Michael they needed him to gain an extra 40 pounds for that role in order to fit the king's pen physique and that's when he started eating bad foods every day like fast food burgers steaks and everything plus he would lift weights for 30 minutes a day and power lift one or two reps a day 
That's when the rumor started. He must have been taking steroids. But he wasn't taking steroids. He didn't do none of that stuff, man. Look, after that, he started to get a lot of work doing voice characters for TV shows, video games, movies, because of his famous deep baritone voice. He did the movie Kung Fu Panda, which grossed over $600 million in the box office. Wow, those animated movies be making money, man. He also played Otis in the movie Welcome Home, Roscoe Jenkins with Martin Lawrence, which is a classic. I love that movie too. But see, look, around that time, though, he had went to the doctor. He always went to, Michael always went to the doctor, got checked up all the time, everything. But this time he had went to the doctor, right, for his usual checkup, and he got some bad news about his health. And that was the day he decided to change his life forever. The doctor told him he had sarcoidosis, which was the same condition that killed comedian Bernie Mac. But see, Michael, he had a rare form called cardiac sarcoidosis. Because look, months before, he kept passing out and fainting for no reason and he ended up calling the ambulance one day when he woke up after fainting and the doctor told him he was having syncopal episodes which means you can become unconscious without warning and it's caused by low blood pressure, low blood sugar and dehydration and can cause problems with your heart and the doctor had to give him a pacemaker and that's when he stopped eating meat and became a vegetarian, losing over 90 pounds. And he would work out like crazy. He threw away $5,000 worth of meat that was in his refrigerator. He was trying to get healthy, man. Now, another reason why he also stopped eating meat was because he loved animals. And he had a lot of them. He had like five cats, two dogs, a chinchilla fish and all that now a vegetarian at the age of 51 years old that's when he joined the animal rights organization called PETA which stands for people for the ethical treatment of animals after that months later that's when he met his future fiance Omarosa Manigault who y'all probably know as a reality television personality from the Donald Trump show called the apprentice and she also worked for the trump administration in the white house and vice president al gore during the clinton administration now she and michael actually met in the grocery store whole foods in los angeles in the produce section now a couple he wanted everybody in his family to meet her that's when he invited everybody to his house for a christmas get together but here's the crazy part right now at that christmas party right which was the last time his family saw him talking and walking the family noticed that michael seemed a bit off and was not acting like his natural normal self because he was slurring his words and stumbling around and they know he wasn't drunk or high because he don't drink or smoke they say he just wasn't right and something was going on because he wasn't feeling good and he went to his room, not even staying while everybody was opening up their Christmas gifts, which was strange. He had all his family, his sister, mother, niece, nephew, friend, everybody flew in to come see him and he ends up not even spending time with them, leaving them in the living room because he said he was tired, not feeling good. Hmm. No, y'all. But here's the kicker, though. Then the next thing he does. Changes his will. And he left everything to his fiance, Omarosa. The majority of his estate. And he wrote his family out of the will. Which made them upset and wonder why he did that. And on September 3rd, 2012, Michael Clark Duncan died from complications of a heart attack. 
Now here we go, right? Let's get into the story. What happened? Now, the story goes because see, months earlier, around July 2012, one night he went to bed earlier than his fiance Omarosa. And she said when she got in the bed, she heard him struggling to breathe. And after a while, she couldn't hear anything else. So that's when she jumped out of the bed and realized that he had stopped breathing. That's when she called 911 and started doing CPR on him until the medics arrived. And when they got there, the paramedics told her if it hadn't been for her efforts, he would have died. Now in the hospital, doctors said Michael suffered a massive heart attack and had went into cardiac arrest. He was starved of oxygen and suffered severe brain injury and they had to put him in an induced coma. The doctors also explained by him going without oxygen for more than five minutes before Amarosa was able to restart his heart with CPR. That long five minutes is the outer limit before permanent damage is likely. Now, here's the crazy part. When his family arrived, his sister, his niece, uh, everybody to see him, when they came to see him, they had to stay in a hotel because they were told that his house was locked up and nobody was allowed to go in. Omarosa didn't want nobody in the house. And his house in Woodland Hills, beautiful house. 7,000 square feet, seven bedrooms, seven bathrooms, a giant media screening room, huge built-in fish tank, three-sided glass fireplace, swimming pool, gym, basketball court, three-car attached garage with a subterranean parking area, everything. Nice place. So look, the family couldn't stay at the house, so they had to stay in the hotel by the airport. Plus, they had no car or no one to take them back and forth, so they had to take like three buses to get back and forth to the hospital. Wow. Then look, at the hospital, the family says Omarosa was asking the doctor for Michael's sperm while he was in a coma. Wow. Now, the family also said that they was never allowed to talk publicly about Michael being hospitalized because Omarosa allegedly felt it would mess up a lot of business deals and contracts that Michael had. Now, another thing she did was tell the family that her and Michael had got engaged in Scotland, Ireland. And to prove it, she showed them a picture photo of a hand with a ring. But then when they looked at her hand, she didn't have a ring on. <laughs> and the family became even more suspicious of her because if that was true, the first person Michael would have told would have been his mom and his sister Judy that he had got engaged. Now, another thing that the family didn't like while Michael was in a coma was she kept bringing up his will because just months before he left everything to her. Hmm. Now, weeks later, they said Michael started to get better. They was trying to say he was getting better, he was doing better. Even, even actress Holly Robinson Pete, who y'all probably know and remember from the show Hanging with Mr. Cooper, she did an interview at that time and saying Michael was responding and doing good. When she went to see him, he wasn't talking or anything, but he was watching TV. His eyes was open. And they had moved him out of intensive care. There was hope that he was going to make it. But then, all of a sudden, things got worse. And he wasn't doing good at all because his organs started shutting down. First, it was his kidneys, then the pancreas. Then he had extremely high blood pressure and other things. And the next thing you know, his whole body just shut all the way down. 
And after being on life support for two months, he ended up dying from respiratory failure. And, and look, and they didn't even do an autopsy. The doctors put on his death certificate that he died of natural causes. Man, that's sad, man. What a shame, man. Now look, at his funeral, all of his celebrity friends paid their respects from Tom Hanks, Jay Leno, Loretta Devine, and many more. Angie Stone, Kelly Price, Kenny Lattimore all sang with the choir. Stevie Wonder was on the video, did a tribute. Now, also at the funeral, Omarosa told everybody that her and Michael were engaged to be married and she showed everybody the ring he brought her. But Michael's family said that was not the ring she was showing everyone in the picture at the hospital. <laughs> wow. They said that was not the ring that she showed everybody at the hospital. And another thing the family wanted everybody to know was Michael was about to break up with Omarosa right before his death and had started dating other people. Hmm. They said Michael was a playboy. Now, after his death, they say Omarosa had an estate sale and sold most of Michael's belongings, including the things family members had asked for, like his green mile chair, his watches, cologne for his nephews, and a bunch of other stuff. Omarosa also put his house on the market for $1.3 million because she said it's just too big for just her and the two dogs and she just missed Michael so much and she was looking at a condo in one of Trump's properties. Wow. And like I said, Michael's family, man, they call her a snake because she made Michael change his will just months before he succumbed to his heart attack and died. And it's written in the will that if anybody in the will contested, they get nothing. And the family just don't understand why would Michael leave personal family things to a girlfriend? Why was she the main beneficiary? Omarosa controlled everything. Even when the family picked out flowers for his funeral, she changed them and she just planned the whole funeral herself. Now, Michael's sister, Judy Duncan, she hired her own lawyer to investigate the drastic change in her brother's will. And look, he did, Michael did leave his sister $100,000, which was stated in the will, but his sister Judy still believes Michael was not of sound mind when he made this decision. And he hadn't been himself lately. And there's a lot of other things they wanted to bring to the light. Like Omarosa, she didn't allow none of his friends to visit Michael in the hospital on purpose. Telling them that he was going to be okay. They just, she just told him he'd be alright. She just told him that to keep them away. But one of the main issues that Judy Duncan, Michael's sister, had with Omarosa was that how she left Michael all alone after his initial heart attack in July 2012 until his death in September 3rd, 2012. Now, Judy claimed that when Michael died, Omarosa was at the time joining a family reunion in Florida with her mother on the day he died. Wow. Plus, with his mysterious death, the family had requested for an autopsy, but no autopsy was performed, which made it difficult to assess what happened to him in his final last days. But look, Omarosa, she fired back, man. She went back at the family. She accused them of coming out of the woodwork, demanding money immediately after his death. Omarosa told the media that she doesn't control the estate or the finances and his sister Judy knows that. She said, if you would see all of Judy's emails and text messages to her, you would see that she is just trying to get money from her and threatened to go to the press if she did not give it to her and that's a crime. That's what Omarosa said. 
said Judy was threatening her to go to the press if she didn't give her money and all this. But but Judy said all she asked her for was a monthly pay to help with their mother who's suffering with Alzheimer's disease. She said, wow, it's crazy, man. In 2013, just five weeks after Michael's death, Latoya Jackson <laughs> and Amarosa appeared on Donald Trump's All-Star Celebrity Apprentice show. And they got into it pretty bad, which led to Latoya Jackson saying, Michael had a heart attack. I'm sure she gave it to him. And she was a conniving, scheming, cutthroat, and probably pulled the cord on Michael Clark Duncan. Wow. That's great. Latoya Jackson. That's That clip is on YouTube. Y'all want to check it out. Now, after LaToya made that statement, though, Omarosa tried to sue LaToya for defamation. She tried to sue her. The crazy part is this. While filming the show, the Donald Trump Apprentice show, Omarosa heard that TMZ was going to release the 911 call she had made the night that Michael got the heart attack. And when she heard that, she put a stop to it. The 911 call was never released. And that's why the family, very suspicious, man. Especially after that 911 call was blocked, they want to hear that 911 call. And that's what's making them think that his death wasn't natural or through complications. They think maybe someone else had a hand in it. Hmm. And another person Omarosa was mad at was Claudia Jordan for posting a photo of Michael's funeral to her Instagram after Omarosa told everybody not to post his pics online. But Claudia Jordan fired back saying she had a photographer right by Michael's body. What she's talking about. And she claimed that Omarosa used Michael's funeral as a press opportunity because she had red carpet there and she said she didn't even cry she didn't even see Omarosa cry wow shaking my head she said <laughs> Claudia Jordan said at that funeral she was actually appalled by some of the people who were making appearances at the funeral and she was very disgusted with how things were at the funeral calling it a mockery she called a funeral a mockery Claudia Jordan and Omarosa used to be good friends but Claudia Jordan claimed that Omarosa told her that she had access to some of the money from the charity that Michael Clark Duncan had and if she needed it she would use it and she said Omarosa like I said they was good friends now so she probably told her this. She said she would brag every day about the money that Michael left behind and how his mom didn't get this and that and how she got everything. Wow. That's sad, man. And look, Michael Clark Duncan's grave was left unmarked for almost a whole year because of all the family fighting, according to Omarosa, who claimed she had to step in and order a memorial plaque you know well, years later man 2017 Omarosa got married again to her second husband who's a pastor and she also released a book titled Unhinged plus she's a reverend now at the church so she changed her life man you know and I hope Michael Clark Duncan's family man y'all need to put that book out Put that book out so we can get the real story on Michael Clark Duncan, his sister Judy and everybody, man. And hopefully everybody's doing good because I know losing him was a big loss, man, for the family because, you know, Michael loved his mama and his sister, man. He loved his family. My prayers go out to y'all, man. He was 54 years old. A health nut, vegetarian, the last three years of his life, good shape and everything. He was 54 years old. 
R.I.P. Michael Clark Duncan.